We are so excited that you've joined us today. You're about to hear a message from our pastor, Mike McFadder from the Crossing Worship Center. Please make sure you are following us on YouTube and Facebook. We pray that this message draws you closer to the Lord and encourages you. My subject tonight is the battlefield of prayer. Uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things I could talk to you about. But, you know, I have to bring you, number one, what the will of God is. But as much as that, I, I, I feel sometimes to, to help you understand maybe where you are and what you're going through and how to win the battles, wh- how to get to the next level, so to speak, how to, how to be more victorious than you are defeated. There are a lot of people that they don't ever get started good. You know, if you don't start out on the right road, you won't end in your destination. Right? You know that? I've had to back out some dead ends. Take road, thought I was doing right. Anybody ever done that? Back, back out. Have to tell the family, sorry, I missed it. (laughs) You know, but you know what? When you get in the right path, the Bible talks about a path. When you get on that right path and you begin to serve the Lord, You can just know that you're going to have to find where you are in the Bible. This book is not outdated. They're saying about us that we are outdated, that we're not relevant anymore because the book's older. You know, it talks about things like faithfulness to your wife. That's kind of strange and weird these days. You know, thou shalt not steal. (laughs) That's kind of old-fashioned these days. So they start telling us that the Bible is, is not really relevant, and then they attack our kids, our youth, our children, and then from the levels of higher learning, so to speak, in college, you know, my, my nephew's going off to college, and we had a family night <coughs> just kind of loving on him some, and, and uh, his dad said to him, you are going to absolutely be, try to be re-indoctrinated. You're going to have to know what you believe and believe what you know. Now, he's eight, 17, 18, you know what I'm saying? And, and we're sending him off. But what we believe is that the word of God will keep him. Y'all believe that, right? So we're excited about that. We know that if he'll do what this book says and what he's been taught, he'll be all right. He's not going to win every battle. He's not going to win every battle. But what you can do is find a way to get better at what you are trying to accomplish. If I could say to you tonight anything that I think would help you as an individual Christian, it would be to learn how to pray. There is no greater weapon, not faithfulness, not consistency, not necessarily reading your Bible. You have to have a prayer life. So we're going to talk a little bit about it in Luke chapter number 22. I'm going to pick it up right here because this is the story. We're not going to necessarily have the scriptures on the um, screen tonight, so use your Bible. Luke chapter 22. If you don't have it, you can pull it up on your phone. We used to like to hear the pages turning. A little funny story. When I first started pastoring about 10 years ago, there was this lady and she was really part of the leadership, and every time I'd start preaching, she pulled her phone up, and she sat like on the second row, and I was like, what is she doing? <laughs> I was like, what's the problem? I mean, right when I start preaching, she got the phone up, you know. So I, th- <laughs> you know, you know, when you're pastoring, you know everything. And I said something, kind of a little snide remark about it, so later, you know, that morning, she came over, she said, pastor, it's my Bible. I got my Bible, <laughs> and I just kind of said back to her, it really didn't dawn on me. This was 10 years ago, not that the cell phone was new then, but for me, we were still using the book. You know what I'm saying? And one day, my power went out, and my phone died, and I had to go get my book. And one day, I came up here with my iPad, and it went bleep, and... I promised myself I won't ever come back up here without the book. 
<laughs> so we're going to pick it up right here, Luke chapter 22, verse 41. We'll read about three verses. And when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and prayed. This is Jesus. If Jesus needs to pray, we need to pray. <laughs> okay? Y'all pretty good with that? That's pretty simple. Okay. And he knelt down to pray and said, Father, in case you're wondering if there's still a trinity. I don't know how you read this book and not believe in the trinity. Y'all with me? Uh, it's relevant stuff now. I face it all the time. I'm sure you do too. You're going to face some people who don't believe what you believe. I want you to know what you believe in this book. Father, if it was your will. Now, this is Jesus asking about the cross. And he asked the Father, is it your will that I take this cup? If it would be your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I want to stop here and say, pray whatever you want to pray. Look at me. Pray whatever you want to pray. Ask God about anything you want to ask God about. But at the end of your prayer, you say to him, not my will, but your will be done. Because that's, that's where you're going to get the satisfaction. Because, you know, we can ask, you know, my old I didn't know him very long. He was one of Jimmy Swaggart's missionaries for years. He died when I first met him, Brother Greenaway. And he used to say, just pray your dumb prayers and let God, let Jesus deliver it to God the right way. <laughs> you know, he was 80-something years old, and he had prayed so much. He just said, well, you, most of our prayers are off base. But he said, God takes and Jesus takes them and delivers them to God in the right form. So he's saying, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Now, an angel, verse 43, appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in what? Agony. Agony. This is not because, it wasn't because Jesus was just uh, having a hard time getting through, like we say sometimes. I, son, I didn't pray, I just had a hard time getting through. That wasn't what it was about. The agony he was dealing with was what the subject matter he was facing. Now, a lot of times, if I have to say to you and I in the beginning of this, a lot of times, if I'm in a hard place, it's harder to pray than if I'm doing well. I can focus better. But if I'm in a, like, instant, I'm in trouble or something, I, I don't know about you, but I lose all of that religious jargon, our Heavenly Father, glory to God. All that goes out the window and I end up in this one or two words, help me, Jesus. <laughs> you know, but, I, but Jesus is praying here, and he's talking to the Father, and he's in agony because of what he's dealing with. And he prayed earnestly. Underline that. Then his sweat became great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We know that's what that happened. So let me talk to you a few minutes about prayer. <clears throat> now, prayer, once you are born again, you quickly realize that you need something more in your life. That's probably the first revelation of being truly saved. All of a sudden, you realize the world's problems are really bigger than you imagined. Even the world gets more real once a person gets born again. You know, the mental stress after I got saved actually increased because I began to see things for what they really were. And the third thing is this, is that I had a real vivid revelation that I had an enemy of my soul whose name is Satan. Now, if you've never run into him, you're probably not saved. If you don't have a rebuttal or a resistance in your life, listen to pastor. Check out your salvation. This is not worth going through the motions, folks. One day we will hear a trumpet and you going or not going. So don't let the systematicness of church keep you from being real to yourself. 
Well, I think I'm saved. Well, I've been in church a long time. Well, I said a little prayer back whenever. Make sure that you know that you are. And one of the greatest ways to know that is if you feel that resistance of the enemy. Now, prayer is an act of people who believe and learn. You know, if you don't believe in God, you don't really have a prayer life. Because only people, now you say, well, there's other, other, other doctrines or other religions. They pray more than you. You know that, right? There's other religions that pray more than you and I pray. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. I want you to know something about who you approach in your time of prayer. Now, if this is the... This is the this is a powerful chapter here, but he says in verse number 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Prayer is an act of faith, no doubt about it. So without it, it is impossible to please him, but for he who comes to God must believe that he what? That he is. He is what? He's God. Okay, we're not, we're not bowing to totem poles and we're not praying to to all of the mythical gods that we learned about in school and Zeus and, and all of those things are, you know, the, 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 so many different, like the Egyptian gods that they had, they believe, they pray, they would sacrifice to those gods. But if you're going to really, listen to me, establish your prayer life, you're going to have to push yourself to a place where you believe God is who he says he is. Now, I know you think you believe it, but... You're going to have to push yourself beyond where you are and say to yourself, God, I know you are God. Now, look at what he says. To believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is not impressed by our shallowness. You see, if God knows he can heal somebody in an instant of time and we're worried about that and we've been sick for six months or, or whatever it is and we're just stressed out about it, God's not stressed out about it because he knows he can heal in an instant. What he wants to know is if you come to me, do you really believe that I'm God and then I will reward you for being diligent in your seeking of me? Now, Christian-wise... The one of the first things that happens when you're slipping is you lose your prayer life. Because your prayer life's what maintains you. So I can tell you, if, if I ever run into somebody that's slipping, first thing I know is they're stopping praying. Don't matter if you're the pastor or the person just got saved. Notice that about yourself because if you stop going to God, you stop being rewarded. God knows, what he says stuff like this. I know what you have need of before you what? All right, that's God. All right, I can do far and above what? Ask or think. So what is prayer about? Prayer is about your heart and your communion with God. That's what I'm talking about. When you go to God, you have to go knowing who he is. Don't make him your daddy. Don't make him some mythical creature. He knows you. Okay? But he also wants you to know him. That's why I talked to you guys about two weeks in a row about being reverent with God. Right? Because you can't just act like you know God and ignore the fact that he is the supreme being. <laughs> People these days act like God's just, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not knocking anybody. I just remember there was a book out, you know, Coffee with Jesus or something. I'm not knocking that. I know what they're trying to say is he's intimate and, 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 and it's personal. I get that. But for us, if it goes too far that way, you're going to lose the importance of who God is. Can I pray at the sink and in the truck? You better. Is there, a, is there a significant reason for you to turn that off and go to the prayer room? Not just the church, but there's a place I go pray in my house. You got one? You need to get you one. Huh? 
You, don't, you remember praying when you're sick over the toilet. I mean, geez, that's not what I'm talking about. Not that spot. <laughs> not when we're hollering hallelujah while we're selling Buicks. <laughs> you know, blah. You know, I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about like the other night, Leanne was gone. We're working up here. She was, uh, she was up here. I was at home watching the ball game on the TV, and I felt a little nudge. Come see me. Now, I didn't. <laughs> no, don't hold it against me. The ball game was on. You ever shuck it off? You ever been hit in the head? I know you guys. Guys, you remember getting hit in the noggin? You shake it off. That's what they would tell us. Shake it off. I don't know what that means, but get the cobwebs out. I kind of shuck off the voice of God. <laughs> Ooh, I know God wouldn't ask me to come right now. But I ended up going into where I have, a, I have a little altar that I have. I went in there and prayed. So that's the reality of what I do individually when you're not there. Who are you when you're not here? That's one of them yikes moments. Because I know... When I started having to establish my prayer life, I was talking to Lindsay today, and we were talking about it because she was not, Lynn was like eight months pregnant when we got saved, so right there when she was born, we got saved. And so we had just bought a single wide trailer and put it over in my dad's trailer park in Southport, and I got saved, and everybody I knew at the time at the church was like prayer warriors. That's not much anymore, but you just knew these folks knew God. Who You run into them. You know, they had names, and I thought, man, thank God, they have a whole lot more than I got. And so I started asking around, what's going on? Things that would come up. Have you learned to start praying yet? They would ask me, as a young man, are you praying yet? They'd call you out. Come here a minute. I, you know, they could just, you're sitting there. Come here, come here, come here. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, fill him with the Holy Ghost. I don't know what the Holy Ghost was. But I read it in the Bible. I'm not here to try to establish something that's not in this book. Jesus said things like this. A man ought to always pray. How do we find our way to praying always? What stops us is our busy life, number one. But I believe prayer can become an attitude. An attitude. What does that mean? No matter what I'm doing, I'm conscious of him. Gas pump, or at the hospital in emergency. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Now, real quickly, I'm gonna move through this first part here so I can get to the points I need to. When you first get saved, you realize that you need more. That's what I said. You have an inner drive that changes your way of looking at life. You realize your marriage needs help, your finances need help. There are vices in your life, because when I got saved and I went home, I, I still had all the stuff in the refrigerator, still had all the stuff hid. You know, you know what I'm saying? There were still vices in my life that I had to deal with. A lot of people, they, they go home. That's one, that, one of the reasons most people don't get saved is they don't know what they're going to do with their life once they give it to Jesus. See, they don't understand yet the importance of the new birth. They think the old person's got to go home and try to live right. Are you hearing me? You can't go home revamped and live right. It won't work. You have to be born again. And that is what we have to continue to teach. And that is the miracle that Jesus does for you. How do we know we've been born again? I now have a desire to do and be in God's presence. If, if God doesn't give me a new desire, I'm still going to want to get drunk, right? But what God gives you when you get saved is a fresh desire to do things like pray. So that's why I went in that prayer room at my, at my trailer, not knowing anything about prayer, there was something stirring in me, and 32 years or 31 years later, it's still stirring. I remember going in an old blue shag carpet and I'd lay in there, try to pray and fall asleep. 
Anybody ever prayed and fell asleep? I used to go in the prayer room. We'd be at the church. We'd go to the prayer room. Somebody would be, in there, be an old guy in there. Because it's cool in there and dark. And he laid down there to go pray. And he got, Lord, help me out. And that old cool air hit him. I don't know it's criticism. At least he's in the prayer room. Right? Then he woke up. But at least understand that about you. I tell people this sometimes. Before I would do something that made it seem to God that I was uninterested, I changed my posture. That's the first thing I want you to know about prayer. Prayer changes your posture. Prayer is a posture driven experience. Okay? Now, I pray, I pray walking. I pray, I start out usually at the altar or kneeling, and then I get up and I have to walk because I, if I can't just sit there, my knee starts hurting or my back or so, so I get up and I start, I start praying. So my posture changes because there's a new person in me. I have to make myself go pray. I learned that prayer was one of the greatest weapons I had. And when you get saved, you realize that your sight has now been opened to the fact that God is who he says he is. And he requires you to do what that new person in you is capable of doing. Don't ask your flesh to help you. Do you know the difference between you and your spirit man? Pastor, you're talking about some kind of weird something now. No, I'm telling you, when I got saved, Jesus came in, saved me, and I got born again. My spirit, man, is now a revival. I saw God again. Now, in that setting of seeing God, there's that revelation that I'm not who I say. Every man that's ever said in this Bible, they'll say something like this. Oh, God, I am a man of unclean lips. That's what seeing God does revelates to you that you're a sinner now once you get saved that new person in you has those new desires if you're not hungry for the things of God listen to me you're either backsliding or you're not saved that's one of my pastoral struggles with the current church they say they love Jesus and never ever do anything that as resembles the fact that they love Jesus they don't want to be in church. They don't want to pray. They don't want to read their Bible. They just simply want to go to heaven and not hell. And I'm not going to do the rest of it. And if you push me, you're judging me. And I'm just saying to you, I've lived that life. I've said those things to people. The last place I wanted to be before I got saved was church. Now, my parents took me to church. When I was 16, I remember bucking my daddy about getting up and going to church. And matter of fact, there was, a, there was a year or two he just left me to myself. I was running and drinking and doing all that stuff that we shouldn't have done. And, and, and I, I, but there was a time, there was a time when I started going to church, I realized this is boring to me. Church is boring if you're not saved. But Sunday morning was a fun, I'm going to say it's just about heaven. Now these kind of moments right here, this is when you're, this is when you're, you know, you've cooked some of that home cooked food like, you know, chicken and dumplings. That's what these Thursday nights kind of thing are. It's not a T-bone steak and, and we're sitting down with this gourmet meal. We're just trying to get something that will put some strength in you. Your eyes have been opened. Do you now hunger for Jesus? Do you have a desire to be in his presence? Do you understand that he wants to connect with you and he moves you by his spirit to go pray, to go read, to be faithful? If you begin to fall away, I promise you, you can look around you and know that you are losing your prayer life if you've ever had one. Most people, I can tell you, if they don't get born again, they'll drift off. They having it in there, ain't they? Jesus on the main line. Tell him why. <laughs> they gonna have better listening kids in there singing. Excites me. 
Oh, goodness. Uh, Exodus 17, the posture that we have, prayer, number one, is the humbling of your soul to acknowledging God. Here we see the reality that is true in the spirit. In Exodus chapter number 17, verse number 8, uh, which says, Now Amalek came and fought against Israel in Rephidim. Moses, that's the leader of Israel, said to Joshua, that man that was next to him, he said, Choose us out some men to go fight the Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the, on the hill with the rod of God in my hand, so Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held up or supported his hands on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Listen to this. And Joshua defeated Amalek his, his, and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek under heaven. He's saying this, as long as Moses' hands were up, Joshua, not Moses, Joshua and the church won the battles. This posture is relevant to God. It means I surrender to you and your will. Now, in that in that holding up of his hands and that surrender, what he's saying is that reality is in his spirit that prayer maintained in a stressful situation, when the devil attacks, he'll attack you with things and problems and troubles and deceptions. Anybody here him feeling playing those mental games? You get busy in your life, and it keeps us from the basics of prayer or needing God to continue to fight for us. Satan attacks, distracts us. We get tired, and we lose self-esteem. We get depressed and discouraged because he attacks, and we're not winning. And our flesh doesn't want to pray when you feel that way. When you're not winning... You're not going to want to go pray. Have you noticed that? When I'm down and out and I don't feel it right, the last thing I want to do is pray. I get in there, and if it does anything comes out, it's a complaint. Oh, I complain. Oh, God, you've left me. Oh, God, what's wrong? How come I, how come I lost my job? Lord, how come I, you know, we're, not, we're struggling so bad? Lord, how come you? I'm feeling so depressed? All of that is the enemy's attempt, listen to me, to bring you down. This whole story is in the book to say this to you. Whatever it took to hold up the posture, Aaron and Hur did it for, for Moses. They held up this posture of hands up. It simply means, I know if you don't fight for me, I won't win. You got it? You say it's not important. When the hands went down, the enemy started winning. When a church quits praying, you can rest assured the enemy's going to start taking ground. Come on now. You, you with me? And look, I look in your eyes, and I know most of you are people who have been saved a long time. And you know what I'm saying is true. But what happens is, we hear it, but we're like when we, before we got saved, we don't know how to apply it. We are busy. What, do you need to go to prison not to be so busy? Huh? I'm asking. You ever heard the people say, I got kids and I ain't got time to pray. I prayed that prayer. Me and her prayed that prayer until one time, I guess God got tired of hearing it and said, well, I can take them back. If they're going to keep you from me, 
Come on, somebody. God don't talk to you that way. See, I, I, he knows me. I'm his. He looks at me and goes, this thing, this kept them away from you. Your hands went down and the enemy came in your house. Your posture to God went down and the enemy came in and he has taken over your morale. You're discouraged. You don't know what to do. And after a while, you're just busy being, just busy being miserable. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the enemy. Jesus had to go pray to God, and that prayer he knew had to make a difference for him to be able to hang on that cross. Prayer has to change something, or we can't go to the next step. Are you with me? In Matthew 21, it, it, it talks just real quickly. The, I'll get back to the New Testament, because I want you to see that our flesh doesn't want to pray. There's two sides to you. Most of the time I run into that fleshly person. Huh? Are you here? <laughs> I can make your flesh fight and mad. Come on, somebody. Because I know my flesh, and I know flesh is flesh. That's what the Bible tells me. Flesh doesn't like man told me one time, a friend of mine, he said, error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, error is always aggressive. He told me, error is always aggressive. I said, what are you trying to say? He said, well, when I confront somebody, let's just say, you know, they, they, let's, use, let's just use drugs. If I said, look, you don't, you don't need to be on drugs. They don't typically say back to me, thank you, I, I really appreciate your concern. Usually, error will come at you. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me. You don't understand. See, here it comes. Error usually is aggressive. That flesh will defend itself. Jesus told us at one point in the Bible, he said, Do not repay evil for evil, for I am what? I am the avenger. Right? Right? So you have to watch yourself, Matthew 20, Matthew 21, 12. The flesh is part of the problem. It's just simply what I'm saying. And Jesus answered and said to them, Surely I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, it shall be done. Are you, do you believe this book? And whatever things you ask in prayer, comma, believing, see, that separates. You, you, you can throw the comma out if you want to. God didn't throw the comma out. We pray prayers not believing. It's too big. It's too much trouble. We don't know. We can't be, God, when is God going to do it? If you said, if you pray that prayer believing, you will receive. Our flesh doesn't want to pray. So it takes being aggressive sometimes with yourself. I wish I could teach the modern church that. Your problem is not one another. Your problem is not me. Your problem is the guy or the woman in the mirror that you've given all of the passes to. That you sat there giving every example and pass and said, they just don't understand. I'm a pretty good person. I really have these issues. I, do, they, I'm a, I, just, uh, I just don't know sometimes. Nobody understands me. And I'm in the middle of preaching one night. So I just want to tell you that it's not just about you. I'm in the middle of preaching. I tell this story a lot because it, so, it was so impactful. And I'm about, you know, I'm talking about David slinging the stone to, to hit Goliath. And I'm on the platform. I'm about over here on the left-hand side. And, and I'm, I'm just in front of the church. I'm saying, you know, get that anointing and God will anoint you. And be ready to take down God's enemies. I'm preaching. And I, and I, and I went to throw that, throw that stone like that in my spirit. And it's like God rushed me up to, to the giant. Like, like just took me from, from here he was back there at the back, so to speak, and, and all of a sudden he just rushed me up there. Listen to me. Listen to me. 
Inside of that helmet was my own face. In the middle of preaching. The problem I could throw a stone at as long as it wasn't me. And my arm dropped. I remember just dropping my, and I said to the church, give me just a second. You see, God was trying to teach me something. I knew it because as a youth pastor, I took a mirror, and I went around to the kids, and I said, I want to show you something. Your biggest problem is who's in that mirror. And I said, don't matter if you're 15 or 55, that's your problem. But as I got older, we get more religious. We get more comfortable in ourselves. Start believing about it. It's okay for you to have confidence in what God's doing in you. But don't ignore when you start slipping or start having the attitude that is not helpful for yourself. I couldn't throw the stone when I saw myself in that helmet. I thought, my God, I made a giant out of my flesh. And he rules. Tell him you're not going to eat. He'll strangle you that day. Tell him you're going to have to go apologize to your person you don't want to apologize to. Tell me which one's in charge, flesh or spirit. You're going to set yourself for the next week to get up at 6 o'clock and go to your prayer room. You're going to set your alarm. You're not going to let nothing else keep you from it. And you tell me who's in charge. You tell yourself, I can't get up at 6, got to work, Pastor. Okay, 6 at night when you're home. I want you to tell your wife or your husband, 6 o'clock. Now, if you cook supper and put it on the table, I'm not eating it. At 6 o'clock, I'm going to pray, and I'll be in there 30 minutes. You hear me? Try it. See who's in charge. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, your flesh will get super-duper religious. It'll say hallelujah and amen. I'm sitting on the front row. I wonder sometimes. Just raise your hand if you got your own personal stories. Just tell me. Just tell me you got stories. Come on. I need more hands than that. I get discouraged. Thank you. I'm on the front row, Brother Jeremy, at the church. And Leanne, when we used to, when we went to church, we had to go back that afternoon, 4 o'clock, 4.30, because you had choir and all that. So she would put something in the crock pot, and we'd go home and eat. We didn't go out to eat much. took too long. And so she had put a ham on when ham was one of my favorite meals. And she had put a ham in the crock pot and poured over the top of it. She had poured uh, uh, pineapples and pineapple juice. And it had cooked all night. And she had peeled potatoes, real ones, not instant bag potatoes, real potatoes. And she had chipped them up. And we, you know, we had a meal waiting on us. Hallelujah. Church was just getting finished. And I'm on the front row. And the Lord, sure as I'm standing there, looked at me and said, I want you to fast lunch. I said, instantly, my, I felt like that wave of, oh, my God, that wasn't him. Because I, ah, that wasn't, and it just stayed right there in my pit of my stomach. Oh, God. And all of a sudden, the excitement from the church service left. And I'm going out the door, getting the car. And she said, what's wrong? I don't know. I don't even know what to say. I, I just, I feel like the Lord said something to me, but I don't think he meant it. I don't, <clears throat> I don't think he meant it. I'm, I'm going to ask him if he really meant it. He said, what did he say? I said, he, to he told me I needed to fast for lunch. I'm starving. You cook my favorite. Now, folks, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're laughing because it's funny. Well, what are you going to do when God challenges who you are with him? I had to tell her, I said, he told me not to eat lunch. I mean, the whole time I'm in there, what would you mean that? About 1 o'clock I said, now I've done good. <laughs> I've done good. Am I released? 
And really, honestly, about after about 2 o'clock, I'd finally settled in my mind. I felt like he said to me, I just wanted to show you something. I just want to show you at the peak, at the peak of your excitement with God. You just come out of church. You're ready. You're fired up. You're excited. But I want you to know something. Your flesh ain't far. You better know that about yourself. God's going to teach you. Somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah, God's going to teach you. I'm not the only one on the potter's wheel getting taught here. Y'all not going to make me single by myself. Yeah, you're just hoping God don't say that to you tonight. I hadn't eaten supper tonight. Jesus, glory. Oh, hallelujah. Don't wear something I put on you. You make sure it's God. Go to Jonah, a book of Jonah. This is that book of a man that really loved the Lord. Now, now the second, the second thing is I want you to know, number one, posture means something. Number two, prayer bring, brings clarity to your Christian life. Prayer will br- bring clarity to your Christian life. And I want you to understand that in this subject that we're about to talk about, this man is very confident in who he is. Okay, not only is he confident, but God's confident in him. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amantai, saying, number, verse number 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry against it, and the wickedness has come before me. Now, prayer brings clarity to your Christian life. So in verse number 1, Jonah knows the voice of God. Jonah knows the voice of God. Jonah knows the voice of God. If I watch God do anything, as soon as you start feeling that you're called to do something, he'll challenge whether or not you know the voice of God. He'll give you some project. He'll give you something to say. He's going to challenge whether or not you heard me. He'll say something like this. Go give your friend a $5 bill. Why, why would he say something like that? Number one, to just see if you do it. But number two, see, five doesn't give you much. If you had a 50, you get that, oh, a, a 50. Everybody likes that. Uh, me? You're going to give me? Everybody, see, that's when we go, ah. Yeah, the Lord told me to give you 50. <laughs> but five. What you, the Lord told you to give me five dollars. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate that. That was nice of you. Thank you. That was weird. <laughs> what am I going to do with five dollars? Can't even buy one gallon of gas. Five dollars. See, see, but that's, that's the challenge of the voice. That's the challenge of the voice. Are you willing to do what he tells you to do Even if you don't get to look good. The prayer that you know God's voice does not always mean that you will do the right thing. Verse number five. Then the mariners were afraid, even cried out to his God through the cargo that was on the ship off into the sea, lightened the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, had laid down and went to sleep. In the storm. Who does that sound like? Oh, isn't that awesome? I mean, if you just look at the surface of it, we've got a man here that acts like Jesus in the storm. (laughs) I mean, the storm's so bad, they're throwing the tackle off. They're getting rid of the cargo that was so precious to them because that ship's about to sink. And where is Jonah who's told to go to Nineveh, but he didn't go. Where did he go? Is he worried? Oh, my God, I'm out of the will of God. Oh, my God, I'm out of the will of God. No, no, no. God told him to go to Nineveh. He's headed to Tarshish and sound asleep. Come on, somebody that's been saved more than 15 years. You can get so spiritually knowledgeable that God, you can even sleep in the middle of a storm that is supposed to wake you 
up. Called COVID. Huh? Y'all remember when COVID hit? Ah! The church emptied for, for purpose. We didn't ever know what we was finding out. It emptied. We finally come back. It was full. Like the towers. 9-11. Oh, my God. Oh, the end of the world. Y2K. The computers are going to shut down. Oh, my God. At least it moved us. But don't much move people no more. Have you noticed? I ain't talking about the world. I'm talking about people that have justified their backslidden condition because they hadn't prayed. They know they're not in the will of God, and they're able to sit under sleep in this hour. They don't feel any urgency to pray, read their Bible, go to church. They don't feel anything about the shh. It was supposed to wake him up. I mean, it's supposed to. This man of God who knows the voice of God was supposed to be woken up, but he wasn't. And in verse 7 said, they said one to another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come on us. Do y'all know there's a scripture that says, be sure your sins will find you out? Is any side, anybody, hey, 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 that's one of the reasons I try to keep at that altar. What's that old fat preacher going down there for? I ain't telling you. No, I'm afraid the hand of God will come out of the atmosphere and write down on the wall what I thought like yesterday. Yeah. He wouldn't do that. He's done it before. You want God to write down with your attitude about the church? What you think about your neighbor? Huh? <laughs> now, and it cats lots. And, and all of a sudden, out of all the people, they cast lots, those short straw. Guess who got the short straw? Jonah. Guess who's always going to get the short straw? Every one of us who knows better. You might not have picked it yet, but if you keep doing what you're doing, your straw's going to be picked up and everybody's going to know it was you. Oh, it's Jonah. Oh. And, now, now, now this guy knows the voice. Now, I'm just talking about prayer. I'm talking about how, how prayer can keep your Christian life together. He knows the voice of God. He's still asleep. The storm didn't throw him up. Verse number 9, look what it says. And he said to them, y'all ready? This is Jonah now. This is, this is, this is Jonah. I'm a Hebrew. <laughs> hey, hey. Hey, I'm a shouter. I'm a, you, hey, I, I'm one of God's people. I mean, he just looked at him and said, hey, I'm a, I, I, hey, hey, I'm a Hebrew. That said some significant stuff when he said that. I fear the Lord, somebody. Oh, shout now. Let me ask you folks just here on 2022, and we've already read the story. Do y'all really believe he feared the Lord? I believe he feared the Lord one day. But I believe he got so religious, he lost that. And anytime you lose your fear of the Lord, you will lose your connection to him. You won't reverence him. You won't act right around him. And you will start telling everybody what you are. I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Christian. I pray all the time. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, he said, who made the sea and <laughs> preaching. This is the problem, and that joker's preaching. He has lost his ability to understand when I'm the problem. Prayer, prayer, prayer. You can be a prophet. You can be a prophet, which is what Jonah was, and totally miss God. 
Verse 13 and 15, nevertheless, the man rode harder. They tried to save the old boy's life. They rode harder to return to land. God ain't going to let you return. And the seas continued to grow with the tempest against them. How I, I, I get out of this? I, I know how to do this. I knew how to, Let me show you how to get out of this trouble with God. I, I'll show you how to. <laughs> Just start working more. You know how he's talking about it. Just go to church more. You got to get you in trouble with God. Whole time you know you're not where you need to be. I just I think I'll do. I think what I'll do is I'll go back to church. I think what I'll do is I'll get in there and start singing. I've had some people come to this church and I said, oh, look at here who's here. Oh, Pastor Mike. I'm telling you, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm going to get in there and serve the Lord. I'm telling you, Pastor Mike, I've been wanting. You just don't know how, how much I love the Lord. About 30 days. Where are they? Have y'all seen sister so-and-so, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so? Somebody else share something with me, you know. I'm always getting a little something shared with me, and I'm glad. I, I'm just saying most of the time I already know the story. I already know the story. What is the story? Flesh got back up. Praying prophets don't mean you can't get fleshly. Huh? Just because you taught Sunday school for 30 years don't mean you can't be the flesh in the church. Come on, somebody. I know. You better be glad these kids are still going over here. I'd have to close. <laughs> However, the tempest continued, verse 14. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord. We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. <laughs> You're the problem. Did I tell us that we are the problem sometimes? You know what you're going to find out in your prayer is that when you need to get your Christian life under control, this is, this is, this is the end of June thereabout. The first message I preached this year, does anybody remember what the coming in message was titled? You ain't, you, you're just too close to me. What was my... <laughs> I've had been in these mess, these services. Oh, God, he's asking a mess. Let me look back on my notes. How many of you not really can't, you can't remember six days ago. I realize you can't remember six months ago. It's not a rhetorical question. My first message was temperance. Get yourself under control. That's what God said for this church going into this year. Have self-control. It is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Get yourself under his control. Somebody help me say amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen, Jesus. Hallelujah. And verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and throw that joker in the sea. Are you ready? And the sea calmed. <laughs> Would <laughs> Now listen. I'm going to ask you a question. Could you be in a storm because you're not in the will of God? You think the storm's going to end, but God ain't going to let it end because you're not where you need to be. I don't care what you throw off. I don't care what you lighten the load with. The storm's going to blow until you say, okay, what you want? And his orders did not change to Jonah. I told you to go to Nineveh. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. And none of that matters to God. Don't go into your prayer time telling God all of your resume. Go in there believing, understanding that sometimes there's a storm in your life. And prayer is what you find out that maybe the storm I need to look at it and see if maybe I'm the reason it's blowing. It helps you. There, if God don't help us keep our Christian life, we're not going to be able to keep it together. Somebody help me say amen. I mean, God's got to help you. James chapter 5. Kids are still going. I'm moving. Thank you for being patient with me. You want to stand up and do some jumping jacks? Y'all okay. I'm going to keep going just for a minute. I want to give you a minute at the end just to ask some, like I said, some questions. James chapter 5, verse 13. My third point is this. Prayer can clear up your mind. Are you having trouble in your mind? You need to go pray. Now listen to what he says. Because, because listen to me, guilt and condemnation are not going away until you do. 
if you no longer get guilty over sin, I, I don't know how to say this to you. I, I don't know. I'm not here to judge your salvation, but I'm just telling you there's no way a Christian can sin and, and it be okay. I don't care how much grace you pour on my head. I know when I'm wrong, okay? And I'm thankful for grace. And I preach grace and going to be preaching it here again here pretty soon. But James said this, why would Jesus say, now think about this, this is inspired word of God. James chapter 5, verse 13. Anyone among you suffering, question mark, let him pray. <laughs> Anybody here suffering, he said, let him pray. Anyone cheerful, let him sing. I think we got that backwards. I think we have that backwards. Sometimes I think we say sing when we ought to be praying. Huh? I think, don't you think sometimes the church has that backwards? I'm just talking about the modern church. It sings itself, trying to make itself feel better. It's living in suffering. It's almost closed. It's just in a mess. And we just keep singing ourselves and singing, singing, and singing. I just wish we'd go pray. That's what it says. Verse 14. Is anybody here sick? Now Jesus is saying, James said, is anybody sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will do what? Save the sick, karma, and the Lord will raise him up. Huh? Are you with me? Now, we're praying for sick people. We're not praying for saved people. We're not praying people get saved. We're praying for somebody that's sick. And he said, and the prayer of faith and his sins... If he has committed sin, he'll be forgiven. He come up to get healing on his neck. Take the all, pray the prayer of faith, and God said, I'll heal his sin. The correlation is this. The sin could be the neck problem. God sometimes will heal the sin Forgive the sin so the neck or the back or whatever the suffering or the sickness can go away. Let me tell it to you like this. Jesus, when he was praying for the man with the palsy, he said to him, your sins are forgiven. And that's when they said to him, you've blasphemed. They made him mad. And he said, is it easier for me to forgive sins or heal somebody? See, the correlation is that Jesus knew he can't be healed if he's full of guilt, he's sinned, he's done something wrong, he's now feeling guilty and he cannot, you can heal his neck, but you cannot release his heart. If we don't pray that he would be healed in his sins, then the guilt that he carries away from there is going to destroy him even if he gets the healing he needs. Sometimes the unrepented sins cause the results to linger. He had forgiven her and made up and total, accepted and told her he forgave her or him. And when he is virtually the most important thing you can do is learn the value of prayer. Sin sometimes caused your problem. And if you repent of that or go to ask God to pray and just pray over, sometimes when God's healing you from your suffering, he'll also forgive you for your sins because that guilt is what's causing you most of the problem. Now I'm going to summarize it with this. Number one, sustain victory through your continued posture in prayer. Number two, even mature Christians bring difficulty to their own lives by going through the motions. Got me? And sin and trouble go together. James said, lay hands on the sick and pray the prayer of faith, and physical and the spiritual will be healed. How many of us are suffering because prayer has been marginalized in our life? M marginalized, that was the word God gave me. I looked it up. Insignificant. Prayer has become insignificant. And it's supposed to be our priority. Thank you for listening and don't forget to follow us on YouTube and Facebook so you don't miss out on any future content from the Crossing Worship Center. Thank you again and God bless.